Now we're going to shift our attention to the underground comics scene, which was burgeoning at around the same time that the regular comic scene was transitioning from the Silver Age to the Bronze Age. And I chose this image to sort of uh, be the, the title image, if you will, because in a lot of ways, this is, uh, this is iconic. This is an iconic image closely associated with underground comics. It's from a cartoon we'll look at in a second by Robert Crumb, who's probably uh, the most well-known of the underground comics artists. Uh, in fact, the same, uh, uh, same motif was used uh, in the book, A History of Underground Comics. So uh, this actually comes from Zap Comics number one in 1968, which the underground comics era roughly was 1968 uh, until about 1973 or 74. That was uh, uh, a short period of time, but a lot happened. And Robert Crumb, who usually signs his name R. Crumb, had this uh, one-page, one-page comic in in Zap Comics, uh, "Keep On Trucking," that really caught on quickly with uh, the audiences of this not very widely distributed comic book, and and quickly spread into the general culture. The idea being, you know, it's uh, "Keep On Trucking," just keep keep moving forward uh, and don't give up. That's kind of the idea. It's a good message. And uh, just to show you how, how popular this became, um, within a couple of years, by 1970, it was showing up on t-shirts that were being sold in regular comic books. Uh, and so were a lot of other Robert Crumb images. In fact, by 1976, the same company, Roach, that made the T-shirts, were also uh, selling iron-ons that you know you could put them on your T-shirt or your jacket or wherever you wanted. And um, it, this is one of the many ads, and this showed up in almost every comic book: Marvel, DC, uh, Gold Key, all of them. And you'll notice down there, the lower uh, left, you can't see it very well, but that's the "Keep on Trucking" uh, thing. And then. Above that and to the right, you see an old guy in a white beard that says, uh, uh, just passing through. That's Robert Crumb's iconic character, Mr. Natural. Um, and then there were others. Uh, there was one uh, that said, get down. And my favorite one, my favorite one, favorite one uh, said, uh, I think it had Mr. Natural on it. It said, do unto others and then split. Now... The underground comics scene really started in San Francisco. And like I said, 1968, that was the year I was born. And it spread mostly uh, to some larger cities, like uh, New York City especially, Los Angeles, and so forth. Now, I, as a young kid in the 70s, did not have access to these underground comics even if I had been, you know, 18 or, or, or 21, uh, they just weren't available anywhere around rural Appalachia. Probably in Nashville, you could have uh, you could have found some copies. And yet, still, I was familiar with it, in part because of the ubiquity of this "keep on trucking." Um, well, meme. They didn't call them memes then, but that's that's what it was, and it became part of. Uh, became part of the uh, national vocabulary. And there were other things I was exposed to as well that were sort of residual things from the underground comics movement we'll talk about later. But before we do that, and before we more clearly define underground comics, we're going to kind of step back, go back in time, and look at the things that were the predecessors of underground comics, the things that gradually led up to that that scene happening. And we're going to do the same thing later, by the way, with graphic novels. Um, so, underground comics were, were comics that were not sold, they were not printed by uh, 
conventional publishers. They weren't distributed around the country. You know, they didn't uh, have uh, circulation managers. They didn't have distributing deals, and they didn't get delivered on trucks and taken to all the, uh, um, you know, all the gas stations and, and so forth at the time like regular comic books did. In fact, often they were just, uh, they were written and drawn by the artists who would uh, sometimes have a press available to them, but in the early years would just uh, basically photocopy, mimeograph. Mimeograph the pages, make a bunch of copies and staple them together and sell them themselves. Um, on the street corner, or get deals uh, with um, various uh, various businesses, first in the city of San Francisco and then other larger cities that would sell them. So it's that's why it's underground. There's no Comics Code Authority here because there's no regulation of this this business. There's no censorship. There's no uh, industry standards because there is no industry. It's just a bunch of individuals making stuff. Okay. Well, to look at the first instances of that kind of comics, got to go all the way back to the 1930s. Um, and these, uh, these little booklets that were made from the 30s and these things were still around in the late 1950s and into the early 60s, although by that point they were just a kind of novelty items. They were called Tijuana Bibles, um, which is kind of a uh, um, kind of an ironic term because these things are anything but biblical. And the Tijuana part comes from the kind of the, uh, the general belief, which was not accurate, uh, that they were manufactured in Mexico and brought across the border. They were actually, uh, just like later the underground comic scenes in San Francisco, they were often made and put together by individuals. Uh, sometimes they got some wider distribution under the table, um, in part through the influence of the mafia who uh, uh, took a cut from these things. They were uh, 10 cents, just like a comic book was. Although actually these things, these things in some ways, I mean, they were, you were starting to see them around the same time that the first comics appeared in 1935, maybe even a little bit earlier. So essentially what they were was pretty small, pieces of paper, small pages that were small enough to fit in, the whole thing would fit in the palm of your hand. You could carry it in the palm of your hand for concealment. Um, and there were eight pages usually in these things, and they were mimeographed, that's how they made the copies, and then stapled together. Like in the lower right-hand corner, you can see that one, you can see the staple. There's only one staple holding the whole thing together. And what these were, and I have the, some covers, but I don't have any interiors to show you because this was, it, it was pornography. There were, it was extremely, extremely explicit pornography that frequently starred um, comic book characters, characters from comic strips, sometimes... Uh, famous actors, actresses, and singers, and, as in the lower left-hand corner there, um, notorious criminals sometimes. John Dillinger was a bank robber that was famous at that time. Now, um, of course, no one got permission to do this. Uh, no one got... Uh, this was completely unregulated. It was underground. It was under the table. So the way that you would get these is they would be available in places where men tended to gather, like uh, bars, um, sometimes barber shops, um, garages, bowling alleys, they would uh, they would be kept under under the table, under the counter, and you had to know 
to ask for them, and word would be out if they were available. And sometimes you could find them at newsstands, but they weren't distributed the regular way, and they were kept hidden unless you knew to ask for them because they were illegal, um, not just because of copyright violation, but because they, uh, uh, they were in violation of all kinds of different decency laws from the time. Um, lower right-hand corner there, uh, that is a reference to the famous actress Clara Bow, B-O-W. Uh, so you can see uh, the kind of direction that, that those, things, those things would take. And like I said, they were still making them in the 1950s. They were making them about uh, Elvis Presley and Marilyn Monroe by that time. Now, odd thing about this is that with all the discussion that we had earlier about the arrival of comic books and about sort of the, the predecessors, the prototypes for comic books, I really should have mentioned this then because... What's really significant about these things is that they were, uh, well, they were not reprinted comic strips, obviously, because this stuff's not going to be in the newspaper, um, but they were original material, right? Before Detective Comics number one in 1937, which was the first comic book with original material. This was very original material. Well, like I said, there were, um, there were still um, these things, Tijuana Bibles, in the 1950s. But in the 1950s, there was another sort of independent operation that I've kind of uh, obliquely referenced a couple of times when talking about Joe Schuster that we should take a moment to look at. And that was this independent comic book, really. Um, well, there was a lot of text stories, and it was illustrated in a comic book style. Illustrated by Joe Schuster, who by that point was hurting for money and was starting to develop eyesight problems, so his time as an artist was limited, and he was trying to make money any way he could. And he had a next-door neighbor that was part of this thing called the Malkla Publishing company, which was, uh, I think, Molino and Clarence, the last names of the two guys who had this operation. And essentially, um, one of them did all the writing, one of these two guys, one of them did all the writing under different uh, pen names, and the other one happened to have a printing press down in his basement. And so this book, which started in 1954 and ran for 16 issues, Nights of Horror, was uh, S and M sadomasochism bondage stories um, illustrated in the Joe Schuster style? Now, uh, as you can see, there was uh, there was some nudity, not nearly, nowhere nearly to the extent of the Tijuana Bibles, which you could still find, like I said at that time, which were extremely explicit. Uh, but there was some. Some nudity. The upper left-hand corner um, uh, sample there, that's, that's about as much nudity as, as you would get. Uh, but there was, lots of, there was lots of beating and whipping and uh, electrical torture and all kinds of other stuff. Uh, now these, um, like the, the Tijuana Bibles, they were, uh, they were sold under the counter at various different places. Book stands had them, but it was very much a shady underground operation. Well, in the summer of 1954, when this book had only been coming out for a short time, there was a sensational murder trial in New York City that involved three teenagers that were known as the Brooklyn Thrill Killers. And what they were doing, they were, uh, I think a, by the time they were brought to trial, one was 17 and two were 18. So they were younger than this. So 16, 17 years old when the crimes were taking place. They were wandering around Brooklyn, beating up 
vagrants beating up homeless people uh, and torturing and in two cases murdering homeless people um, here on the upper left hand corner you've got I think that's the district attorney holding up the bullwhip that they used to whip the homeless people that they victimized well this is pretty sadistic this is pretty troubling um, so clearly uh, people doing stuff like that probably if they're gonna go on trial especially probably should see a psychologist and they're underage they're juvenile delinquents so they should see a psychologist who specializes in juvenile delinquents gee I wonder who that would be why here he is dr. Frederick Wortham MD fresh off of testifying before the Senate subcommittee hearings about comic books and his book seduction of the innocent um, out by this time uh, so he is the uh, expert in juvenile delinquency and crime so he's brought in and of course the first thing he asks is how about those comic books? I bet you read comic books. And uh, asks them what kind of comic books they read. And he finds out they'd been reading Nights of Terror. And they gained access uh, uh, to their copies because, well, this book was also available by mail order. And there was an ad in the back of a horror comic book uh, that was published by Atlas, alias Marvel. And the ad didn't have like these pictures by Joe Schuster. That would never have made it to the stands. But it was an ad for a catalog of novelties. All kinds of, of exotic and different kinds of things, uh, which was kind of cover, you know. And so these, uh, these young guys, uh, this one in particular, got a hold of uh, this catalog. And one of the things in the catalog was this this magazine which he was then able to read and boy Frederick Wortham had a field day with that now remember he thought Superman was just nasty and terrible now he didn't know nobody knew that the guy drawing these pictures who seemed to be imitating the style of Superman was actually Joe Schuster no one knew that for years afterward um, he really would have had a field day had he known that but um, the um, the magazine Night Terrors and the fact that it was it was purchased through a horror comic wound up being something that was heavily focused on during the trial of the one of one of the guys turned state's evidence against the other two and then the other two went to jail for a very long time uh, and all this is happening the trial is in the news them being thrill killers and claiming to get their ideas uh, from uh, these comic books. And in fact, the ad uh, for that catalog, the, the thing right above it was an ad for a bullwhip that, that you can buy. Uh, this was around the same time that the Comics Code Authority was being formed. So that kind of sped, sped things along there. So uh, we got the uh, Tijuana Bibles, basically uh, cut-rate mimeographed pornography. Uh, and then you've got things like Knights of Terror, uh, bondage magazines, bondage comics. And there were other titles. Uh, in fact, Steve Ditko, remember we talked about him, his roommate uh, worked for uh, a magazine like this. However, after the murder trial, New York City banned Knights of Terror and things like it and after the ban was on after the ban was announced the police raided several newsstands around the city and uh, several of them in Times Square and found copies of it still being sold so uh, they uh, they took all the copies that they found and destroyed them which means that uh, it is really hard to find a copy of those those magazines because not many survived. And then they arrested the people who were selling them. And uh, one of the um, owners of one of the newsstands went to court saying that his First Amendment rights were being violated by censorship. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, in a 5-4 to four 
decision upheld the censorship, admitting that it was censorship, but saying that it was pornography, so that's okay, right? Um, anyway, uh, if you were caught with any of this stuff uh, and you were selling it, you, you, could be, uh, you could be arrested. So that's pretty underground. Well, now we're going to shift away from back rooms, under-the-counter sales, and secret printing presses and uh, briefly go back to the world of conventional publishing, what some people might have called legitimate publishing, and Harvey Kurtzman and his humor magazine, Help. We talked about that before. Remember, that's where that, uh, that Archie parody that, uh, that got him sued came out. And uh, just, uh, just a reminder, uh, Help came out in 1960. It was also in the 1960s that Kurtzman and Will Elder started doing the uh, Little Annie Fanny comic book in Playboy magazine. Well, Help was not an underground comic. It was a magazine, and it was distributed and sold at newsstands. Uh, and in fact, it was published by Warren. Warren uh, Publications, uh, so they had uh, their first... Uh, big success had been Famous Monsters of Filmland. Uh, then they launched this thing. And then a couple of years later, they launched their horror stuff. So uh, Harvey Kurtzman and the magazine Help. Why are we talking about that in connection with underground comics? Well, a couple of reasons. For one thing, it is a more legitimate, as in legal, uh, way of appealing to... Uh, to adults with adult content, but also we're looking at it because of the people who worked on this magazine. So Harvey Kurtzman was the editor and uh, the writer of most of the stuff. Uh, he brought with him some people from Mad after he got uh, he got mad uh, at Bill Gaines and, and quit. Will Elder, Jack Davis, and Al Jaffe, although Davis was also still working at Mad. Um, but in addition to those three artists, and this is why we're talking about it, he also had Robert Crumb and Gilbert Shelton. Uh, this was how the two of them got their professional start in the, uh, the comics business. And their particular sensibilities, which might not have gone over real well, say, at DC Comics, uh, was able to flourish at this kind of madcap magazine that was bridging the divide between Mad and Playboy. Now, also working there was another artist, Terry Gillum, who was uh, an assistant uh, editor, I think, eventually at the magazine, and did a lot of the a lot of the artwork. Maybe the name Terry Gillum is familiar to you. Um, if you are familiar with Monty Python's Flying Circus. Terry Gillum was one of the members of that in the late 60s, several years after this. The only American member, and he was the one who did all the animation for the, uh, for the TV show, Monty Python's Flying Circus. In addition, a couple of people who weren't on staff but contributed as freelancers were the... Uh, the British writer and comedian who was just starting out. He, had, he was a writer for a couple of British comedy shows. John Cleese. Maybe you're familiar with his name. Um, if you're familiar with Monty Python, he was one of the members also of Monty Python. And he's you know, done a lot of other stuff since. Also another contributor, uh, a stand-up comedian named Woody Allen. Maybe you've heard of him. If you haven't heard of him, I'll let you Google it. And finally, Gloria Steinem. That may have gotten your attention if you know who Gloria Steinem is. Gloria Steinem was one of, well, probably the most publicly known spokesperson for the women's liberation movement in the 1970s. She was one of the... Uh, uh, most influential feminists in the United States in the 1970s. But in 1960, 
She was Harvey Kurtzman's secretary at the magazine Help, and as such, she was uh, responsible for trying to get these burgeoning semi-celebrities like John Cleese and Woody Allen involved in the book. Uh, later on, she said uh, she said kind things about Kurtzman and uh, seemed to have enjoyed her experience, um, but totally, you know, maybe not what you would expect. Um, as sort of the uh, professional beginnings, the career beginnings of, of Gloria Steinem, who, by the way, by the way, Gloria Steinem, when she was a little girl, do you know what she loved? Wonder Woman. Which is why, later, when she established the feminist magazine Ms., Wonder Woman was on, on the first cover. Anyway, so, uh, here are... Uh, uh, a couple of a uh, couple of photographs from the magazine. There's Woody Allen in the fake mustache. They did these things that were called fumetti, and Cracked also did this, and so did other magazines. It's where they take photographs and then caption them with word balloons like they're a comic book. And in the case of Help, they they didn't take existing photographs like stills from from movies. They made their own and made up the story. So here's one that Woody Allen wrote and performed in. And then here's here's the one where visitor to the United States, John Cleese, uh, was involved in a multi-page story about a dad who falls madly in love with his daughter's Barbie doll. Now, I've mentioned uh, both Terry Gillum and John Cleese in reference to Monty Python's Flying Circus. There they are in their later years. Uh, and there's a sample of the uh, animation of uh, Terry Gillum. If, you, uh, if you're up on your Monty Python, if you're up on your Pythons, and you know the, the members of the group, maybe you've wondered how there wound up being five British comedians who mostly knew each other before this, and this one American guy who was a cartoonist, how the heck did that happen? Well, that happened because of Help Magazine. John Cleese met Terry Gillum in his trip to the United States when he was doing work for Help Magazine. So uh, Robert Crumb and Sheldon Gilbert, uh, I'm sorry, Gilbert Shelton, uh, we briefly mentioned, we're going to talk a lot more about them. So they're going to be two of the most prominent people in the underground comics movement. Help Magazine is also where they got their start. And despite the fact that Help was a, uh, a conventional and legal magazine from a, uh, um, a, an actual legitimate publisher that had distribution and all that stuff, the sensibilities of the book, as demonstrated by that Archie parody, among other things, was very much in line with the types of things that would be done by underground comics artists. So, in some ways, help, legitimate though it may have been, and above board, was also kind of like a missing link in between the, uh, the Tijuana Bibles and the underground comics movement. All right, well, let's... Uh, Let's get that more specific definition. So 1968 to around 1975, mid-70s, um, underground comics, and it was spelled this way with an X, uh, sort of to denote that it's not regular comics. Okay, uh, Independent publishers, some of them so independent that they were the whole operation, but others, I mean, there were some publishing uh, houses that got started as underground comics. They were not censored because they weren't sold in the conventional way. Uh, comics Code Authority was meaningless. They initially were mostly satire, much like, uh, much like help. Um, they dealt often with the uh, hippie culture, uh, the drug subculture, both of which were burgeoning, I've used that word a lot, haven't I, in San Francisco in 1968. Um, sometimes they were very psychedelic, which was becoming an in thing. Uh, that 
kind of had at least tangentially a uh, a connection at least in many people's minds with the use of LSD they were very anti-establishment much like Mad Magazine uh, and and help uh, they were counter culture which is to say not the norm not the normal culture at all now pretty quickly you started to see a, a different kind of underground comics beyond the uh, the zany uh, kind of drug and sex oriented satire you started seeing very autobiographical stories by the writers and artists uh, expressing themselves about their their life experience uh, and that became kind of a, a second norm uh, so there's really like two kinds and they kind of overlap sometimes uh, something could be both those things at once uh, satiric and humorous and autobiographical um, in San Francisco and in lar other large cities when uh, this movement spread the place uh, you were the places you were most likely to be able to find underground comics were in what were called head shops uh, which were little stores that uh, kind of specialized in hippie counterculture things they were also sometimes called smoke shops because on paper uh, legally they were like uh, selling stuff to smoke tobacco with but they weren't actually selling stuff just to smoke tobacco with right um, so these types of things you go in there and uh, they didn't have them under the counter you could uh, you could peruse them uh, I mentioned that some presses got started um, last gasp comics was one ripoff press was another kitchen sink press which actually started off as an underground comics uh, operation and by the 1980s had grown into kind of a prestige format of comic book publishing and you had uh, in, in New York City you had uh, the magazine the East Village other which was a venue for many different underground comics artists in New York City 